Good afternoon. You're all very welcome to this session, uh, Deep Learning, an introduction. My name is Brendan Considine, and this is my first time to Bevox, DevOx Belgium. Um, and it's, uh, I, I arrived here this morning. Uh, it was a bit rainy, and uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you afterwards. Uh, I've been to uh, Belgium once before, but this is my first time uh, here outside the airport. So, uh, thanks very much. Um, I guess I'll start with uh, a brief introduction to who I am, uh, and we'll go into um, some different topics. You're welcome to raise your hands, um, and I'll hold brief pauses for questions. Um, but I think the room is a little bit too large to do uh, an interruption. Um, so, maybe if we can wait till then, and then uh, we'll open it up. Uh, so, I have a background in computer science and machine learning. Um, I'm very interested in uh, speech recognition. So, this is something um, I think has been uh, progressing very quickly over the last few years, and uh, uh, it has lots of applications. So, uh, that was what primarily piqued my interest in machine learning. And uh, I studied at university for uh, four years at Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. And uh, out of college, I worked for a small ad startup in Austin, Texas, called OneSpot. Um, we did uh, programmatic advertising content uh, uh, sequencing and things like this. Um, after that, I spent two years as a developer advocate at JetBrains, where I helped build developer tools and uh, teach people about how to use uh, some of the great IDEs that they have. I'm interested in uh, lots of different topics, um, primarily with uh, regards to language learning. So uh, in college, I spent two years uh, studying abroad in Shanghai. And um, I think uh, there's a lot of interesting applications for machine learning in that domain. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I enjoy writing code and reading and traveling to conferences, um, especially meeting all of you and I look forward to talking to you uh, during this week. Uh, feel free to say hello. Uh, this is how you can reach me online. Um, and uh, I'll be uh, very happy to answer any questions after the session as well. So um, over the last 10, five years actually, probably a very short amount of time, we've seen uh, an enormous amount of progress in uh, in machine learning, and specifically uh, the visual domain. So this is where a lot of the uh, innovation comes from, and, and it's applied to a lot of different areas. Um, so over the last many years, we've had um, lots of uh, competitions for recognizing objects and images. Um, this is the ImageNet image uh, LSVR task, and uh, they run this every year. And over the last... Mm, three or five years, we've seen dramatic progress in uh, reducing the error and increasing accuracy for classifying these images. And the task here is to uh, recognize an image, um, an object inside of an image, uh, and tag it. And if the uh, tag is in the, the, the top five tags, then it gets it correct. Um, and this is how they measure uh, the recognition error. Uh, similarly, in speech, for a long time, they, they were sort of struggling with how to uh, recognize speech accurately. Um, and this was a task that has taken uh, 20 years. So people have been working on this for a long, long time. And it wasn't until recently um, that we were able to realize a, a lot of um, great improvements in uh, recognition accuracy and uh, driving down the, the error rate of uh, recognized speech. And um, so if you look at the word error rate over the last few years in the speech recognition task, um, for, for large vocabularies, uh, it's gotten a lot better. And for small vocabularies, it's, it's perfect. Um, so if you have uh, a small set of vocabulary words you're trying to recognize, say, commands to your, um, your application, then uh, 
if the, the set of commands is relatively small, then you'll be able to get very, very good accuracy. Um, and for transcription, this is uh, very good as well. Um, in fact, this year, uh, the, the recognizers were able to surpass um, the benchmark for uh, human uh, recognition accuracy. So for specialized tasks, it's on par with uh, a transcriber or someone who's um, typing the words as they're hearing them. Um, so how did we get to this point? Uh, this is kind of dramatic progress that wouldn't have been possible um, just a few years ago. Um, so traditionally, researchers attribute this to three things. Um, the emergence of a lot, a lot of data. So terabytes, uh, exabytes of data to train on. Uh, and the availability of this data has allowed them to uh, train very uh, models that generalize very well. Um, secondarily, I think that the availability of enormous amount of computing power um, has accelerated this process. Um, but the core of a lot of these uh, advancements has to do with how we uh, deal with the data. And it wasn't until recently that we figured out how to do um, machine learning in a generalized way um, very well. Uh, so uh, we, we hear a lot about deep learning now. And um, it wasn't until recently that the techniques that they use were uh, available to, to everybody in the, in the community. So maybe a small set of researchers had the ability to use these techniques, and they were um, fairly specialized. So they didn't generalize well to a lot of tasks. Um, and gradually, we're seeing that uh, a, a one or two types of generalized um, neural networks are able to handle a great deal of different tasks without domain-specific expertise. So just to give you a brief idea of how this happened in speech, um, for a long time, they were, they were struggling with feature engineering, with a lot of um, kind of hand, um, manually smoothing out the data and uh, teasing out the relationships between um, phonemes and uh, graphemes and these, these linguistic structures that, um, that are not uh, generalizable across a lot of languages and that are also um, kind of brittle. So, the, uh, the data that you, you feed to it uh, has to be passed through this great long pipeline in order to be actually useful in uh, traditional automatic speech recognition. Um, so the, the end result is, is not always very good. Um, and this is uh, evident in uh, some of the older tools. If you look at Android speech recognition, maybe five or 10 years ago, it wasn't really... Um, uh, usable at all. Um, just for uh, a comparison, the, the average error rate of uh, humans is like 1 to 2% um, for the average word error. And uh, in some tasks, we've surpassed that, and in some, uh, we're, we're qu quickly approaching it. So um, it's kind of interesting. So how can we characterize machine learning? Um, it seems like it has a lot of applications. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do with it. Um, and it doesn't seem to require a lot of uh, domain-specific expertise. Um, so, so we can think of machine learning as kind of a little bit like a black box. And uh, there's the inputs and the outputs. And in, on, the black, on the back of the box, you have a bunch of different knobs that you can turn. And if we do this, if we turn them all in the right position, then given a certain input, it will tell us uh, the output that we expect or the, the one that we want. And uh, the number of knobs is quite large um, for the tasks that an average human can do. Um, so maybe think, uh, if it's one or two knobs, then you can kind of exhaustively search through all of the positions of the knobs and do a brute force search, and then 
that's all well and good. So you can, you can find the optimal solution. Um, but very often, uh, the number of knobs is so large that it would be impossible to search through every configuration of all the knobs um, to get the best uh, output for a set of inputs. Um, so, so I think in, in general, you can characterize machine learning, uh, supervise machine learning, uh, by saying that um, we found better ways to search through the space of all the configurations of the knobs to, uh, to get the result we want. Um, so that's kind of a very 40,000 foot view at machine learning. Um, why do we do machine learning? Uh, well, it's just a toolbox of a lot of, a lot of different uh, algorithms that we can use. We can throw at data. Um, it helps us to predict uh, the future, maybe. Um, uh, to categorize uh, certain sets of things, of objects. Um, it's particularly useful for uh, detecting like, fraud and um, helping us find uh, errors in manufacturing processes and things like this. Um, and you'll see a lot of machine learning applied to advertising. And uh, this is probably the, the most um, uh, lucrative domain for machine learning right now. Uh, the fact that you can uh, personalize an ad for a person um, based on their, their, their age, we estimate, um, and their interests based on their browsing history. So this is something that's uh, probably a lot of research goes into this. And um, it's just one small part of a lot of different things that you can do. Um, another very interesting domain is uh, for playing games. This is something uh, that we do as human beings very, very naturally, and we'd like to be able to convey this ability to uh, our analog, uh, our digital brethren. So, um, but I think very often, like the the domain for these these models is is pretty narrow. So I'd like to give you kind of uh, an area that I'm interested in, and maybe you can um, draw some inspiration for that. Uh, so I come from the perspective of, of education. So I, I'd like to uh, apply machine learning to uh, improve the, the way we, we learn. Um, so you think about uh, traditional education in a classroom setting. Um, it's, it's, it, the, the way I, I went to school, we all were sat in a classroom, and uh, there was one curriculum for everybody. Um, so the, the curriculum is pretty much fixed. Um, and it, it's, if you're a teacher, you're teaching the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, so this is kind of something that, that I think a lot of teachers could um, apl apply their skills to a much greater effect if they were able to make progress and do novel things. Students aren't always completely engaged in the learning content. So this is um, not ideal if you have just a few students who uh, are interested in what they're learning, and the rest of them um, they may be lost uh, track. So this is, there's a lot of uh, different, I guess, deficits in the, the way we teach children. But I, I think, in general, it, it's worked very well. But it doesn't scale. It doesn't really... Um, you, you have a limited set of experts, and um, the the growth rate of uh, of people who are becoming teachers to students is is um, uh, it, is not very good. Um, and and the last thing I think is is critical for education is that uh, the the reward uh, and uh, the the, the uh, well, we, we say punishment, but the, the idea that uh, you can uh, give feedback to students, it's, it's not always incons consistent. So there's a bunch of different things that uh, we can do to improve traditional childhood education. Um, when uh, when, when I, I think of uh, what I'd like the education of the future to be like, um, uh, I think of... Uh, I saw this, this film a long time ago. Um, uh, it's a, a Star Trek film, and... Uh, each of the, the children, uh, they interact with each other and they have 
um, group sessions as well, but there's uh, kind of an, an in individual interface for each of the students, and they kind of get adapted uh, content to what they're interested in, and they'll uh, be able to learn from um, uh, a mix of human experts and machines. So I think uh, teaching assistants is, is a great area that we can apply machine learning to to um, reduce the workload for teachers and tailor uh, a curriculum to a child's interests. Um, so there's, there's lots of things we can track and measure. And um, with, uh, with access to this data, then um, I think we can really tailor the, uh, the learning experience for children. So I think that's kind of interesting and pretty cool. Um, the, the really cool thing, I think, is in generating content. Um, the, the, the content that's available to children is uh, maybe from a textbook that is kind of dry. Um, but uh, using some natural language uh, processing and um, some interesting tools that, that have re just recently come out, we can um, create novel content based on content that uh, they're interested in. So maybe when they're learning grammar, they don't have to learn um, uh, Mary had a little lamb, uh, but something that's um, about their, uh, their interests. So maybe they're interested in, in soccer or something like this. So they can learn, to, um, uh, learn from content that's interesting to them. Uh, just a, an idea. Um, if you're learning a new language, uh, there's a lot of vocabulary. And uh, it's kind of interesting that um, you can rephrase uh, some of these complex sentences into simpler forms. And uh, this is kind of an interesting application of transfer learning in, um, in, in natural language processing. So you can arrange uh, sentences to be more to be to fit the vocabulary of the students. Um, this is from a book, um, Thing Explainer, and uh, it takes large complex words and uh, breaks them up into easy to understand concepts. And uh, maybe we can programmatically do this at some point. I think we're a long way away from that. But um, we can make small steps towards doing something like this. I think it'll be pretty interesting. Um, so I think there's uh, a bunch of things that we can do with grammar. And um, this is uh, just one example of uh, a paper that was generated by, uh, it, it, it's an n-gram uh, generator. So if you know what that is, it just looks at sequences of letters in lots of text. And this is in latex. And it tries to generate something that looks like that. Um, just based on uh, statistics. And it's, it's, it's kind of neat that it, it looks, I think this was accepted to a journal, um, but it's complete gibberish. But it, it's an indication that uh, with enough data and enough uh, intelligence built into the way we uh, structure the data, then we're, we're getting very close to, um, to be maybe not understanding the content, but being generating interesting content for other people to read. Um, so, the, uh, the idea that, um, that, that you can adapt uh, feedback to an individual learner, I think, is, is crucial. And um, this is an idea that's kind of borrowed from uh, ad tech. So, um, in, in advertising, you have uh, some content that's, that's interesting to a similar set of users. This is called... Um, uh, you, and you can filter that content and uh, uh, give it to, to show it to similar users. And this is called collaborative filtering. Um, this is kind of an unsupervised learning technique that we can use to uh, adapt the learning process. So uh, the, the curriculum that a student might see would be uh, tailored to students who have a similar, maybe, performance metrics in, um, in, in uh, literal, lit, uh, lit, or in art or math or something like this. This would be uh, very interesting. I, I'd like to try to uh, generate something like this, uh, data sets for uh, individual learners. So uh, that's just kind of a small taste of a lot of the things that you can do 
Um, for handwriting recognition, this is very good right now. Uh, and so these are kind of low-level tools that you can use to, um, to, to give students um, the ability you know, to, to create you know, homework and content uh, without ha having to deal with latex. Um, speech recognition is, I think, a really exciting area for language learning, um, particularly in relation to uh, speech verification. So uh, when you're learning a language, you spend a lot of time um, you know, reading books and pronouncing the words and having someone uh, validate your pronunciation. And um, it seems like it's a process that could be, if not completely automated, um, have a lot of that training um, be done by uh, a speech recognizer. So um, we, we hear about uh, the, these, these ideas kind of in the abstract, but I think you could apply this uh, to education very effectively. Um, so in this, uh, this, this company I worked for, we, we tried to um, sequence ads in, um, in, in a sequence. So we, we have all this content from uh, uh, the, a company. They generate some blogging and some interesting content about their product. And uh, we tried to figure out the sequence of um, content that would lead to uh, an, an engagement or an action inside of uh, the website. And um, a lot of the content, I think, is kind of structured uh, in education to be um, what the teacher thinks a good sequence might look like. But this, this is another example of uh, adaptively uh, changing the curriculum. Um, Another idea I think that you can use right now when you're learning, I think Duolingo does this. Uh, there's some apps like Anki for uh, memorizing things. Um, and it turns out that uh, this generalizes pretty well. But uh, when, you're, when you're learning new words, it helps to have spaced repetition. And uh, you can apply machine learning to this very easily. You don't even need to use any um, modern techniques. You can just... Uh, it just keep, keep track of this using uh, like Bayesian statistics to determine which words need to be uh, refreshed in someone's memory and which ones are um, pretty much memorized. Um, right, so we talked about a little bit about this. Um, accessibility, I think, is a huge area as well. Um, so there's a, a lot of technology that can be updated with machine learning uh, to, to make it easier for those who have uh, hearing and seeing impairments. So the idea is that um, machine learning sometimes gets a bad rap because uh, it's applied to um, things where maybe you know, are, are, are useful to you um, or useful to a company, um, but uh, aren't well, maybe, maybe they are, but aren't um, improving the the likelihood of our uh, of our species to survive over the long term. Uh, so I think it's kind of interesting. It's in any case, uh, it's it's a philosophical discussion. Um, so you came here today to to learn about machine learning, the fundamentals, uh, the basics, and then we'll uh, talk about uh, some applications you can use these for. Um, but I, th I thought we'd start with a, a brief refresher on some math. Uh, we'll talk a little about supervised and unsupervised learning, and we'll go into some frameworks you can use to uh, help you along that route to implementing something um, which uh, is, is pretty cool. So let's, uh, let's talk about tensors. So tensors uh, are a generalization of uh, an array and a matrix. So you, we work with these all the time. And it turns out that they're pretty useful for representing uh, natural objects, things that you encounter in the real world. Um, so a tensor is just uh, an n dimensional array. There's a joke. Um, so there's uh, a mathematician, a physicist, and an engineer. And they're going to this conference um, about like, string theory. And the uh, 
the physicist is talking about these um, these strings, and he says, "Oh, well, uh, this this object we can represent as uh, a 26-dimensional string, uh, an object in 26 dimensions." And uh, and the engineer says, mm, well, "That's that's that's incredible. I, 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 how how can you even imagine something in 26 dimensions? Like, that's uh, I, I can't even think about that." And, and the mathematician says, "Oh, it's easy. You know, just just imagine something." Just imagine an n-dimensional object and let n be 26. Uh, so, this is kind of the same thing with tensors. Uh, it's so, so we have ways of kind of making them smaller. Um, so maybe if you have a thousand-dimensional tensor, there's only a few of those dimensions you're interested in. So uh, we can make it easier to visualize. Uh, if you're if you're trying to visualize the data, but in general we treat these as uh, just objects, and we can apply mathematical functions to, and uh, we don't try to think too much about uh, what they look like. Um, sometimes they have visual analogs. So this is um, uh, so here in this case it's the same as an array, but if we take it out of the box, then it's a scalar, or this is just a, a class, for example. And um, so we have scalars, we have arrays or vectors, we have matrices, and uh, we can generalize these to, to tensors, which are um, it just you add one dimension. And you, you, so you notice for each of these, um, for a matrix, uh, this is a rank two tensor. Um, and uh, you can index any element inside this with uh, two numbers. And so for a rank n uh, tensor, you need n numbers to index any element. And if there's any mathematicians in the room, and um, you may disagree with me, so they have different definitions of tensors, but this is probably the easiest way to think about a tensor if you're working in machine learning. And so we use them all the time. In uh, any kind of audio task, uh, in speech recognition, for example, um, we can uh, represent, uh, say, like uh, a 10-second sequence of uh, samples as something inside three dimensions. So we have amplitude, uh, frequency, and, and time. And you can transform between the, um, any two of these dimensions. So for time, if you want to transform it to frequency, then there's a, a function that allows you to do this. It's called the fast Fourier transform. Um, and uh, and when we represent this this object as a tensor, um, it's it's very easy to do machine learning on. So um, instead of kind of storing all these variables in an object and doing object-oriented programming, um, you don't really see that very much. There, it's just a a bunch of numbers, and uh, you're applying operations to these numbers. Uh, likewise for images, images can be represented. Um, as a point in uh, a higher dimensional space. So if you have an n by n Im image, that's n by n pixels, then this, is, this can be uh, a single point inside of uh, a space that has n times n dimensions. Um, so you can do interesting things with that uh, by applying certain transforms. Um, so this is a bunch of faces that are averaged together. And it's done pretty much just like how you think it would be done. Um, you take all of the, uh, the pixels and you just you average them for a bunch of different images. Um, so this is an average face. Um, and this is a, uh, a transformation of that. Um, so you can apply a picture with someone who's smiling and do uh, a simple transformation to, to get uh, a, an animation where you're sliding it from one point to the other. Um, so there's some pretty interesting uh, uh, applications of this for, for doing uh, video processing. And um, you might have seen some of them uh, if you watch a series on Netflix called Black Mirror. Uh, there's an episode called Hello Waldo. It's pretty interesting. Um, but this is not science fiction. It's uh, it's 
it's reality. It's, it, I mean, we can do this today very, in real time, very easily. So um, here you have a video of a researcher, and they're applying um, a map. So they, they, they map certain points on his face. And uh, given uh, a target uh, video, they can apply the same transforms to that face to uh, kind of do interesting things. And this, with speech recognition, can create um, some very uh, speech generation, rather, text-to-speech um, uh, applied to a certain person's vocal fr fingerprint can be um, a very interesting idea. Um, so n don't believe anything you see uh, on the internet. Sometimes I think, um, well, I, in any case, it's it's uh, it, it's it's within our reach. It's it's it, it's a, it's we're capable of doing these these things. So, um, right. Um, so we talked a little about tensors. Um, well, uh, an another reason you can think of about tensors, why we need them, is that um, there's all these different uh, variables that are correlated to each other. And uh, we're not sure which ones are, are correlated until we look at the data. Um, but we need to store all of the relationships between all of the variables in order to uh, tease out what the patterns might be later on. And so um, by storing all of the, uh, the, the intersections of all, all of these parameters, then we can we can represent um, some some uh, complex systems. Um, so, for for example, these are highly used in um, uh, like uh, fluid simulation and things like this, where um, a small change in the initial parameters can uh, affect the simulation much a few steps uh, later. So, um, they're used in lots of things, um, and especially in machine learning. Um, so, uh, that's a brief introduction to tensors. Um, so traditionally, there are three types of machine learning we can think about. Um, and these are broken up into these categories. Researchers talk about supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Um, and uh, with supervised learning, you have a bunch of data and a bunch of labels. And uh, this is your training set. And you're trying to learn um, the uh, label for a, a novel uh, item. So you, you have uh, something they're training on, and then uh, later on you receive something that's from, from the same population, you hope, and uh, you try to assign a label to it given uh, what you've learned about the, the training data. Uh, in unsupervised learning, you have no labels. So um, the idea is you want to find what uh, features or collections of features are interesting to you, and then to apply the label uh, uh, later on. And so this is one way to generate labels if you don't have them. And in reinforcement learning, um, possibly uh, the most difficult of the three, um, and uh, one that's kind of, it's making some inroads uh, right now. So you see uh, reinforcement learning being applied to um, games with, with perfect information, like uh, Go. So recently, uh, you might have heard about uh, uh, the competition um, between uh, DeepMind and uh, the, the the leading Go player in Korea, uh, and um, so it it's it, it won, but um, there are some interesting uh, cases where it 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 didn't uh, overall. So uh, reinforcement learning is uh, a very exciting area, and uh, we won't have too much time to talk about it. But it's something that uh, is going to make a lot of progress soon. Uh, the idea is you have an agent, and it performs an action. And the action has an effect on the environment. And you read the result for um, any an action. It gives you some feedback. And the goal is to maximize um, the, uh, the, the total reward from the environment. It's sort of modeled like that. But we'll start with supervised learning. Um, and in supervised learning, there are two big tasks that people like to do. Uh, regression, whereas you have some uh, some real data, some real parameters. They're in um, they're they're numbers, 
and uh, they're sort of continuous, and you're trying to fit a line to these numbers, or um, I say a line, but it, it, this can be an arbitrary function that you're trying to fit. And the idea is to, to minimize the total error for the data set. And in classification, you're trying to find the line or function that gives you the best separation between your two classes or n classes. Um, so I thought we'd have a quick look at linear regression to get started. And um, I have some code for you, so we'll, we'll take a look at um, how to implement linear regression in a framework called TensorFlow. Um, so, uh, in, in linear regression, the task is to, to minimize, uh, to, to draw a line and to minimize the distance between each of the points that you're training on and the line. And this is the line of best fit. Um, in this type of regression, it's called uh, ordinary least squares regression, we're going to use a function called, uh, uh, or, well, it, we're going to minimize the, the, the square error between each of the points and the line. So this is the vertical distance between the point and the line. And for the entire data set, we want to minimize that. So we have a line, we're, go we're going to try to adjust the slope of the line so that uh, the overall error is minimized. So um, I, I know a lot of you uh, probably are Java developers, but uh, this is in Python. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, if you, if you don't have any questions, just uh, raise your hand, and we'll try to. Um, so there's imports in Python. And we're going to use uh, a few different imports to, so one, we're going to need the, the framework. Two, we're going to need NumPy to generate some fake data. And uh, then we're going to show you that data with uh, MATLAB. Matplotlib. So, um, in a lot of uh, deep learning uh, frameworks, um, it's uh, not imperative. So, it's uh, the the model is you set up the the architecture for how you want to process the data, and then you run it, or you run it through a loop, and then uh, you train it, and then you get the result. So here we're going to um, initialize some, some data, just some fake data to play with. Um, some points evenly spaced between negative 1 and 1, and we need 100 of these. And we're going to try to randomize uh, the, the wide domain as well. So uh, just to show you what this looks like, uh, we'll do a scatter plot. So we have some, some data that kind of looks like this. It's centered on the origin, so there's no, uh, there, there, there's no transformation up or down or left or right. Um, and uh, just some random data. And it looks kind of linear, right? So maybe we'll try to apply uh, a linear regression to fit this data. Um, so. Uh, this is a model that has one parameter. So if you think about the black box here, we're going to try to figure out the slope of that line so that it minimizes the overall error for our data set. Um, and initially, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what we set the, the weight to be. It can be uh, zero or random. Um, sometimes you want it to be um, 
a random number in a certain distribution. But here, uh, we'll just set it to zero. And um, in, so we're going to need to model uh, this function. And it's going to be um, a value that we receive. So the input is going to be um, uh, a value, say, x. And uh, we're going to multiply it by a weight. So what we need to do is initialize these variables. And these are going to be inputs to the, uh, the model. So we're going to have two x and uh, y. And we have our weight. Um, and now we need to define a cost function. So we mentioned that the cost for, um, for, for this, this model should be a squared cost function. So we want all the, the costs to be positive. Or this is also called a loss function as well. But so we're going to multiply, um, or we're going to square, rather, the, the difference between y and y model or the, uh, the predicted y for our model. Um, and then when we're training, uh, we're going to try to minimize this cost. So um, the way we set it up is we'll say there's going to be um, a training operation. And we're going to do something called gradient descent. Um, this takes a parameter uh, that's a parameter that represents how fast we should um, or how, how, how long the steps are when we're, when we're doing this. Um, so the smaller the number is, the, uh, the shorter the steps, and the larger the number is, the, the longer the steps. Um, and then we're going to minimize, we're going to use that to minimize our cost function. So um, we've set up the, uh, the computation graph, I guess you could call it. And uh, what we're going to need to do is initialize a session in TensorFlow. Everything is done inside the context of a session. Um, and we're going to initialize all these variables. Um, we're going to kick off the, the uh, operation we, we just uh, specified. And then in our, so this is, this is all set up now. In our training loop, we're going to do uh, two things. One is we're going to um, do this as a fixed amount of times. And um, so this is probably a large number in production. You're going to do this a lot more times. Um, but hopefully, by the time we reach um, 100, then it should stabilize. So we're going to search through the parameter space um, and adjust our estimate as we go along. Um, so in order to do that, we're going to need to iterate um, each time through uh, our entire data set. Um, so what this does is it takes all of our x's and y's and it, um, it, it, it will, will read these in and into uh, our model. So we're going to apply the training operation. Um, and then we're going to pass it in a map. Um, uh, call it's, it's conventionally it's called a, a feed dict in, in TensorFlow. Um, so we're going to bind the, uh, the x to the variable, the placeholder x we spe specified here, and um, we're going to 
find y to y. Finally, we're going to update the value of our weight. And then when we're all done, we're going to close the session. And um, the final value uh, of um, the the weight should be assigned to uh, the, the, the model. So we're going to take the, uh, the Y learned, we'll call it, um, is that each of the, the, the training uh, examples multiplied by the, uh, the, the weight we, we trained. And, and finally, we're going to uh, plot what this looks like. Ah, uh, thank you. Good catch. Okay, so this is the original data. And this is the line we learned. And actually, we should plot this all at once. And let's uh, color this so that we, we can see the difference. Uh, so we fit this line to uh, the data set that we generated. And this line should minimize the uh, overall d cost, or the error, um, inside of our training set. Um, so this is uh, the, the easiest form of uh, linear regression ordinary least squares. You might have learned this in school. Um, and this is uh, a, a very um, common application um, inside of uh, neural nets. Um, so uh, this is traditionally what you learn the first time uh, you learn about supervised learning, um, is how to fit uh, a line to, to data. Um, and there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, sometimes the pattern inside the data isn't linear, uh, and so um, there's, uh, you can model this as maybe a polynomial, and then there are lots of different parameters to, uh, to tune. So you can add more parameters, and the model will become more sophisticated. So are there any questions? OK. So let's talk a little bit about uh, classification. Classification is um, the second step um, when you're learning about supervised learning. And uh, the goal here is to find the line that separates the data um, the most cleanly. And ideally, you want something that not just separates the data, but uh, maximizes the distance between the boundary and all the points um, on average. So um, we, we, we can apply this to lots of different things, where the, uh, the classes that we're trying to learn uh, are discrete. So in uh, regression, the classes are, are, con are, the data is continuous, and we're trying to um, predict, or maybe interpolate or extrapolate um, inside of our data set or outside of our data set based on the pattern that it gives us. Here we're uh, trying to identify items um, based on the, the data. So let's say we have um, two variables, uh, domestication and size. 
and you're trying to find uh, what is a dog and what is a cat just based on uh, data that, that's incoming with these two attributes. Um, so your, your line may start out something like this, and you have uh, just, just a few samples. But as you receive more samples, then you're going to adjust the line, and um, uh, you're, you'll f eventually end up with something uh, that looks like this. And you just have two classes that you're trying to categorize. So this is, um, this is also called regression, somewhat confusingly. Um, it's called logistic regression. And this is uh, trying to fit a binary classes using uh, a, a linear classifier. So this will, this will work if it's linearly separable, um, which means you can draw uh, a line or a plane or uh, a flat surface in some higher dimensional space, um, and it will cleanly separate the two classes. This doesn't always happen in practice, so um, just keep that in mind. But if your data is linearly separable, then you can do this cool algorithm that uh, will separate the, the data and um, will, uh, will, will allow you to um, accurately predict new examples, just given um, the uh, data uh, from the model you've learned. So what does classification look like? Um, this will look kind of similar. So we're going to um, uh, take some, some data, and we have some weights. We've already trained these weights. And we're just going to... Um, Multiply the uh, uh, so to get the prediction, um, we're we're going to multiply each of the uh, the variables by a weight to get uh, prediction, and we're going to uh, gate this um, with something called an activation function. Um, and here, this is just going to be uh, zero or one. So if the the prediction we get is less than zero, we're going to say it's zero. And we encode these classes as zeros and ones because um, it's easy to work with them as, uh, as numerical data rather than strings or something like this. But you can, you can treat, treat it however you want, just as long as you encode it um, consistently. So our training step looks something uh, like this. You, you have some data, it has some features, uh, two features in this case. Um, and uh, we have some weights. And initially, they're all zero, like before. Um, and as we, uh, so we're going to set a threshold. And if it ever falls below um, this threshold, then we're, we're golden. So as long as it's not, um, then we need to keep training. Um, so uh, our total error is initially uh, zero, and then for each item in the set data set, we're going to iterate through all the data set again um, in in batch, so the the entire thing. Um, then uh, what we're going to do is update the error with the difference between what we labeled it as um, and the actual label. Um, we'll call this our error, and then for each of the weights. Um, we're going to update them in the direction of that error. So if the error is negative, it's going to, the weight's going to become less. Uh, if, it's, if it's positive, then uh, we're, we're going to and, uh, increase it. And, and the idea here is that you, the rate that you set is, um, uh, if you set it too small, the, it's going to work very slowly. If you set it too, too large, um, then it might update too quickly and miss some spot in the middle that um, would be a good solution, but we just jump over it. Um, so this looks something like this, uh, if you visualize it. You have each of the input parameters. Um, you're going to multiply them by a weight, sum up the uh, all of these things. Um, this is called... Uh, a dot product or an inner product, by the way, if you're uh, interested. And, um, and then we're going to pass it through uh, an activation function and then update all the weights based on the result. 
um, so in the direction of the error. Uh, and then you update the total error, um, which looks something like that. And, uh, and the, the result, as, as you're doing this, you're going to start out with a um, line looks like this. And it controls the slope and the, uh, the, the up and the down and the left and the right. So the, um, ideally, you're just, there, there's, there's two things. There's a slope and a bias. Um, and it looks like this as it's uh, adapting to the input. So once you've reached um, something that works pretty well for the training data, then uh, you can set it free on new data and novel items. Um, and that's where the exciting part starts. So this, is, um, this algorithm is called uh, Perceptron. Um, and this is um, the basic building block of neural nets. Um, and for many years, the Perceptron uh, was thought as kind of uh, a simple classifier. It's kind of dumb because it misses um, certain, uh, certain pathological cases. Um, so, for example, uh, if it's linearly separable, then it works really well. But um, if your data is not really linearly separable, or if you can't draw a line and it will accurately uh, classify items, then uh, it didn't really work very well. And so um, it turns out the uh, original uh, inventors, I guess you could say, of the, the Perceptron knew about this issue and how to fix it. But it wasn't until um, much later that it was applied um, to great effect. So the classic example here is that um, a Perceptron doesn't work on the XOR function. Uh, so each of the outputs are, uh, uh, are so you can't draw a line. I, no matter where you draw it, it's going to get either half or more wrong. Um, so to fix this, you can do something um, really neat. And this is, uh, this is kind of an idea that, that, that came up very early, but it is used today uh, universally. Um, it's called backpropagation. And what you do is you, you stick these perceptrons, these dumb little perceptrons in sequence. Um, you create layers of these. And um, you do the same sort of training step for each layer. And then you update uh, the, the, the weights for the previous layer in a way that will give you um, the, the outputs for, and the inputs for your current layer um, in the way that you want. So that doesn't make a lot of sense if you hear about it. Um, but <laughs> if, if you look at something like this, so you have an input layer. This is um, where your parameters are, the, the raw data. And you're feeding this to um, called a hidden layer. Uh, and this is a two-layer neural net. And then you pass the output of that layer into um, something called an output layer. And this is, these are all perceptrons. Um, you pass that through an activation function, and you get the output. If it's wrong, then you update the uh, weights for the output layer. And then you update the, the, the weights for the hidden layer to give you the input that you need so that it works. And then, um, and then you do this iteratively. So it turns out you, know, you can do this with a few layers pretty easily, um, just using uh, simple gradient descent and backpropagation. But um, for lots of different layers, if you want to stack these really high, then it becomes difficult to propagate the error back in the chain. And uh, this is kind of a crippling flaw in uh, early neural nets. So they, they couldn't figure out for the longest time how to get this to um, back propagate to the input layers uh, efficiently. So there's all these problems where, uh, since they're dealing with floating points, they're multiplying these floating points together. and it's really difficult to get them to, to stay in a certain range um, because they turn to, to tend to either explode or diminish very quickly. Um, uh, so there, there's a, a few 
key innovations that allowed this to become feasible um, and uh, work really well. But when you're, when you're thinking about um, neural nets, uh, usually the more layers and the, the wider they are, the, the more complex functions um, they can approximate or they can differentiate. So um, for a simple perceptron, you can classify uh, linearly separable data. Um, you add another layer, and it turns out you can solve the XOR problem. Um, but it still kind of doesn't work very well if there's entangled uh, groups. And so um, you add another layer, and it starts looking like uh, it might work for uh, a diverse uh, an interesting set of uh, structured data. So it classifies more patterns more accurately. And this is what we want. Um, so there are different techniques for doing this thing called gradient descent. Um, and they have different strengths and disadvantages. Um, so typically, uh, when you're doing gradient descent with backpropagation, um, the, the training step is, is not done with the entire set of data. So the training set is usually a small set, a batch, or individual samples um, chosen randomly from the training population. Um, and it turns out this works pretty much just as well. Uh, it might zigzag around a little bit, so it doesn't always take the straight path to the, the minimum. And when we say the minimum here, we're talking about the, um, the minimum in the error. So this, this surface that you're looking at is uh, the error surface. Um, and this has lots of different bumps and ridges. And uh, the problem kind of classically was that um, sometimes you get stuck in an area that's not the global minimum. minimum. Um, and th this was kind of very difficult to, to get around. But um, in the end, if for high dimensional data sets, it turns out that it may not be as important to get the global minimum, since there's lots of um, uh, local minima that uh, are approximately as good as the global one. So um, in any case, uh, so where, where, where the, the learning rate comes in is uh, in a few, few places. So you see the ones that are going very slowly. Um, these, are, these are algorithms that are, are tuned to either use um, uh, a very small learning rate or uh, that aren't very smart about updating uh, the next step. Whereas these other ones um, use more complex functions to kind of explore the nearby space and find the uh, the, the direction of the, the gradient downwards and the, um, the, the momentum of how fast this, uh, this point is updating. So there's a, a bunch of different techniques for doing this, and there's some math behind it, but it's beyond me, and uh, uh, it might be beyond, for, for all intents and purposes, it might um, not matter so much as long as you use the best one or the default for a lot of frameworks. Um, so there's lots of different types of neural nets today. Um, and these are used for, uh, for, for different tasks. Um, but uh, primarily, you're seeing lots of deep and wide nets. Um, and so these uh, require a, a lot of training data and a lot of time to train um, on a single core processor. So what uh, is traditionally done is you throw a lot of computing power at it, uh, a lot of GPUs, and uh, you, can, you can train these much more quickly. Um, and it turns out that you don't need to um, uh, kind of synchronize a whole lot between uh, different parts uh, of individual layers. So you can train them in parallel and there doesn't need to be a whole lot of crosstalk um, in the algorithm. So it, it scales to a point very well. Um, and there are different types of 
uh, cells or uh, units inside of these networks. And so uh, there's a kind of a neural network zoo that you can explore to see uh, some of some interesting architectures. Um, so you've seen uh, sort of perceptrons and multilayer perceptrons. Um, but these are kind of just a very small subset. And um, the deep learning architectures are implemented with um, usually uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of layers. And um, each of the, the layers are uh, quite wide, so maybe um, hundreds of, of, of neurons in each layer. Um, so I thought we'd go through a quick example in Java this time of uh, a multilayer perceptron. A multilayer perceptron, um, as, we, as we mentioned, is good at classifying data in uh, a higher dimensional space and uh, data that's not always linear. So I've implemented a simple perceptron here in Java. Um, and we have some sample values and, uh, and weights initially. Um, the, the training loop uh, is, um, it, so it, there's, there's two inner loops here. And uh, this is a, a, about O of, o of n cubed, depending on the, which you define as the, um, the atomic operation. But um, so here we, we iterate through uh, this about a hundred times, and each of the the values in our entire data set we're going to pass through at each each, uh, each iteration so in we're not doing this um, stochastically right we're, rather we're, we're just we're, we're feeding it the entire tra training data set doing the update um, and then uh, evaluating the result and then doing the update again um, so we, we get the actual output uh, of the model uh, of the, the training data, and uh, the error between what we classified it as and the actual. And then we update the, uh, the, the, the total error, and um, we update the weights in the direction of the signal uh, that we're getting from uh, the error for the in entire, for, for that particular instance. Um, and then if the, uh, the total error is ever zero, then we can always um, just quit and r return the result. However, um, it shouldn't, uh, so, so depending on uh, the, the size of your data it, and how, uh, how intertwined the data is, then it may not um, classify it uh, very accurately, uh, even in, uh, the, in infinite amount of time, so there's there's a lot of data that's uh, scrambled up, um, and the classification step is like we mentioned before. We just take all of the uh, parameters and we multiply them by all of the weights, and then uh, we we gate it uh, at zero or one. So uh, let's run this, and you can see the result there. So here we're, we're printing out uh, the total error for that, that instance and um, uh, the, the weights as we're updating them. And so initially, um, we have uh, these weights. So the, this is the, the weight in the x, y, and the bias. Um, the bias, remember, is the uh, amount we're adjusting it, um, vertically. Um, and uh, as we approach uh, the end of our training, we get something that uh, looks pretty good, and then we, we evaluate it. So we do the training uh, set, and then we, we evaluate it on a valid validation set, which is typically um, 
a 60-40. So you have a 60-40 split maybe between uh, all the data you have. You put 40% um, of that inside of your training set and you don't show it anything from the validation set or the test set. A and then you evaluate the quality of your, your model on the validation or test set and then that will give you um, a, a, a graph of uh, the total false uh, negatives, false positives, um, uh, true negatives, and true positives. Um, so, so this is a simple perceptron, and this works if your data is linearly separable. However, if you have something um, that's like an image, it's definitely not linearly separable in a lot of um, instances, majority of instances, and it's in a lot of dimensions. So there's this task called MNIST. MNIST is uh, a, a handwriting recognition task. You have uh, lots of different um, digits that people have written on, on, basically on postcards. And uh, the Postal Service needs a way to figure out what these digits are so they can send it to the right address. So they do some pre-processing, they center it, and they, um, uh, they grayscale it, and uh, they they, they put it in a box, uh, a 28 by 28 pixel box uh, with uh, 0 to 255 gray level values. And um, as we mentioned before, uh, this can be represented, this one instance of uh, a handwritten digit can be represented as a point in um, uh, 784 dimensional space. I think that's right. Um, and uh, and, and so for each of these points, they're all mixed up. Um, you can visualize what they look like um, in uh, this, in some cool ways. So sometimes it's, it's difficult to visualize what your data looks like. And if you don't have the labels, then um, there's some interesting things you can do to try to reduce the amount of dimensions so that it's, um, you can parse it with your, uh, your, your visual cortex. So um, this is an algorithm that, uh, that takes the MNIST data and it, uh, it tries to find the combinations of uh, dimensions and the transformations of the data set so that the groups, the clusters, are the furthest apart. And so they kind of repel each other. Um, and there's different ways of doing this. This is called TSNE. There's another one called Principal Component Analysis, um, or PCA, that will do this for you. Um, but this reduces it, in this case, to three dimensions. You can do it in, a, in different, different ways, in different numbers of dimensions. But uh, So you can see that clusters of these correspond to individual handwritten digits. So here is a cluster of eights and nines. They look pretty similar. So um, what we're trying to do is preserve the, uh, the distance between these points um, while, uh, preserve the distance between uh, similar points while um, repelling uh, dissimilar points, dissimilar instances. So here we have a bunch of twos on this side and they, they look uh, a little bit similar maybe to uh, zeros. Maybe if you um, squint your eyes, maybe a two will look like a zero. But a two looks very dissimilar to something on this side. So let's see if we can, maybe a one. So a straight line uh, is, is very dissimilar to a two. And so in any case, you can uh, use a dimensionality reduction to visualize what your data set looks like. And, uh, and a as, we, as we mentioned, it's, it's not linearly separable. So we're going to have to use something uh, a little more clever to, to separate out these classes. So um, there's this framework called um, Deep learning for Java, and uh, it takes a lot of uh, these 
standard algorithms um, as well as uh, new algorithms that are implemented, that are published, and uh, gives you a nice API to, um, to, to apply these to your data. Um, so if you, if you use this, this is, I think, pretty much the only library for Java that uh, I found is nearing production quality. So it doesn't um, have a bunch of dependencies, which is nice. Um, and it, uh, it tries to do, uh, it, it tries to be a little bit similar to um, some, some, some tools inside Python, like NumPy and uh, SciPy. Um, which is nice because uh, you don't have to do a lot of pre-processing of the data. There's um, functions that allows you to clean up the data and um, and put it in a format and then uh, apply these uh, these algorithms to to model your data. Um, so uh, I'll be using this this sample repository that's available on GitHub. Um, DL4j examples. And uh, they have a bunch of uh, starter tutorials for uh, how to apply MNIST um, and some standard benchmark uh, deep learning tasks, and then uh, take the result and evaluate it using, uh, using some benchmarks. And it gives you uh, the a nice visual interface as well to monitor the progress of your training. So this may take uh, on a single core processor. This may take um, like a few minutes, a few hours, uh, depending on the size of your data and uh, the, the 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 size of the neural net that you're training. Um, it, it can vary. Um, so we have a, a pre-trained model uh, that's just a bunch of weights that's serialized to disk, uh, as well as a structure of the network that we've built. And this is also serialized to disk. It's dumped to a file, um, a zip file. And then we read that in uh, using um, this model serializer. Um, and so this, this has, uh, let's take a look at what the data looks like. So we have something uh, like a digit that uh, we just uh, we, I wrote with my my mouse, and uh, with the the train model, um, I'm going to uh, take that data, uh, read it in as uh, uh, an, an an image that's 28 by 28, um, and then we're going to try to classify it um, using. The, uh, the serialized weights. So um, here we're, we're just going to uh, gate it um, if it's, uh, so it, it, it's black and white. Um, if it's less than 255, it's, uh, it's going to be black, and uh, if, it's, if it's not, then it's, uh, it's white. So the idea here is that the image, the, the training set is uh, inverted. Um, it's a it's a negative, and so we have to transform the input image to get to that same uh, to, to to get it in this the same format. Um, and we're going to evaluate it uh, using three uh, pre-trained models. Uh, so one of them, uh, Lenet, uh, is uh, an implementation of uh, Jan LeCun's, uh uh, solution for for doing MNIST, and it's uh, it uses convolutional nets, which is a kind of state of the art technique for doing MNIST, and has very good results. Um, we'll use uh, a multi-layer perceptron that's uh, one layer, and, and then we'll use one that's two layers, 
and then we'll show the results for each of those, um, for, for each of our classes. A and here, um, the output that it gives you is in an encoding. Um, so we're going to need, uh, let me just show you what this looks like and then tell you what it means. Um, so we read in the, the models, and here the output of the, the model is, is, is given in um, a format called a one-hot encoding. So the classes are indexed uh, 0 through 9 here, and then we're just, the output that it gives you is its confidence that it's in that class. Um, so for example, uh, here it's, it's pretty confident this one is pretty confident that, they're all pretty confident that it's a three. And indeed, it, the digit that we're training it on is a, a three. Um, so let's maybe draw another digit and then see if it gets that one as well. Uh, so you, ideally, you have a bunch of these that you're, train, that you're evaluating it on. Um, So uh, let's try something maybe a little tricky, a uh, four. So four sometimes are misclassified as nines. So maybe um, if uh, the, the model uh, doesn't, doesn't understand the subtleties between a four and a nine, then it will probably misclassify it. And these, are, um, these types of errors are common with uh, shallow networks. Um, so let's say this is a digit, and I'll save that here. Uh, Uh, so we need to make sure that this is saved as a bitmap rather than a PNG. May need to be a let's see JPG. Okay, so it looks like uh, all of them, we fooled the two-layer perceptron. Um, it's, so the, the maximum is still the, the highest, but it has less confidence than uh, the one layer and the, the state of the art. Um, so uh, the four here is, is correct, but this one, the one layer thought it might be an eight, um, maybe a six, but it's probably a four. Um, but if we fudge it around, uh, you'll see that uh, they'll be kind of confused. So, um, so that's a, a kind of a quick introduction to uh, visual 
uh, object recognition uh, and in using the MNIST uh, benchmark. You'll find um, benchmarks for a lot of different algorithms on the uh, MNIST website. And this is where you can download the training set as well. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the error rate for uh, state-of-the-art. Uh, and with uh, a simple linear classifier, you can do pretty well. You can do like 88% um, accuracy. Um, but uh, that was maybe t 20 years ago. Um, so today they, they can do much better. Um, so that was kind of a, a quick introduction to supervised learning. Um, and the idea there is that you have the labels, uh, you have the data, and you're trying to mimic uh, the, the pattern inside of the, the training set um, to, to get a, an accuracy, an a high, high accuracy on your test set. Um, and this, this idea is kind of centered around the, the idea of a teacher. So you're teaching the algorithm these things, and um, this is also where uh, a lot of the progress has been made. So um, in supervised learning, uh, by applying these techniques, you, you can get um, very high accuracy for facial recognition, for speech recognition, um, but you need a lot of labeled data. So the trouble is, how do you get all this labeled data? Um, and you have a bunch of human volunteers who are you know, tagging these results um, or who are transcribing speech, um, but you need like so much labeled data. It's kind of not really feasible for a lot of people. Um, they don't have the budgets to do this. Uh, and if you think about it, if you're, if you're a kid and you're, you're learning uh, what a, the difference between you know, a fire truck and a bus or um, the difference between you know, would, should, could, um, then you need to hear it or see it a few times and then you get the, the pattern. So the, the way we're training um, these networks with supervised learning, there's got to be a better way. Um, and we quite, haven't quite figured it out yet, um, but it seems like uh, we're getting closer. Um, you shouldn't need terabytes of data to get it to recognize something simple like a, a four or a three. Um, so there are a few different uh, ways to approach the problem. Um, and the, the question is, how do we get labels for data that look something like this? Um, so we have, uh, we, we have some data and we have some features, but we don't know which features are interesting or which features have the, are most salient for the tasks we're, we're doing. Some may be very valuable and some are just, they, they're, not, they're independent. It doesn't matter if we have this feature or not. Um, and so uh, this is where supervised learning, unsupervised learning, comes in. Um, so there are a lot of different uh, subcategories of unsupervised learning. Um, and the, the question here is, um, is usually separation uh, or, or clustering of similar things uh, that, are, that are, have nearby um, features in, inside the, the, the space, the, the state space. So um, it's a lot of clustering uh, and association. And there's different methods we can use to do this. Um, but you encounter this all the time. So whenever you go shopping online, uh, you have uh, some suggestions below of customers who um, purchase this item. They also purchased other similar items, or they view this item, and they purchased other items. Um, so you don't need uh, to label all of these data sets. Like, uh, you don't need to label uh, Halloween shoppers and tag them with Halloween, and all the shoppers who are shopping for clothes as um, uh, clothing shoppers. Um, you just look at shoppers who are, who are similar, who have similar interests, and um, suggest similar things. Um, so uh, this is one type of unsupervised learning, as we mentioned, called uh, collaborative filtering. Um, but there's another one that's pretty easy to understand, and I think it's helpful um, to, to uh, 
uh, look at in practice. And um, this is this pretty much the simplest uh, unsupervised learning algorithm you can think of. Um, so the idea here is that we want to uh, cluster something or to find the, the data sets, the, the, spa the, the clusters that are interesting. So um, we have some data and uh, we have some labels. Um, initially, the labels are, uh, they don't matter. Um, we're going to uh, assign the labels in such a way so that um, by the time we're done, that uh, things that look like they're clustered together are all labeled as the same thing. Um, so you initialize the algorithm with a set of random points. Let's say you want three clusters. You have three random points that are randomly chosen inside of the space. And um, what we're going to do is uh, choose these from a set without replacement. Um, and then we're, we're going to have this idea of centers. So um, there's going to be uh, a center for all of the points that are uh, closest to the, the point that we selected, the random point initially. Um, so this is going to have a set of points uh, that are closer to it than any other point, any other center. And, excuse me, not center, any other uh, randomly selected point that we've chosen. And then for all of those points, they're going to have um, an average middle, a middle point or a center. So, um, so you do this for a fixed amount of iterations or until you get tired. And uh, what you're going to do is uh, you're going to initially do copy over all of the old ones and then update the labels of um, everything that's nearest to the center. And let's, um, let's dive into how we update the labels. So um, we're going to take the distance between all of the points to that point. Um, and uh, there's going to be a, a, a set of points that are closer to it than any other point. And uh, if so, then we're going to uh, assign it with the center with that, that point. And then we update all of these with the, the average or the, the middle point uh, of that cluster. So we, it's, it's kind of like, um, I don't know if you've ever balanced a, a cutout of a piece of paper and you find uh, the point where it balances on, a, on the tip of a pencil. Um, and this is, this is the same thing. It's called a, a centroid or center. Um, so we're going to take the mean of all the points in the cluster. And then we're going to um, return all the labels. So we started out with something like this. And uh, we get something that looks like this. Um, and uh, likewise, y you, you, can, you can do this for lots of different data sets. And it works pretty well. Um, as long as uh, the clusters are kind of differentiated, they're not all one big amalgamous blog, blob. Um, so just graphically, uh, the process looks something like this. The, the points are randomly initialized throughout the space, and then they're updated um, iteratively, and all of the points that are closer to it are reassigned to that point. And then by the time it stabilizes, um, or you've reached uh, a certain number of iterations, then you stop and you say, this is, uh, this is the distribution you want. And this is a way to assign labels to unlabeled data. And it really doesn't matter what you call these labels. It's, it's just important that, uh, that they're differentiated, that, they're, that they have um, a good separation. And um, our, our idea here is that this is probably not the best data set to apply uh, k-means. This is called k-means, by the way, to, um, because it looks evenly distributed throughout the space. So typically, when you're doing k-means, then uh, you have uh, some data that, 
that's in a high dimensional space. And it doesn't really work very well if it's in high dimension because the way you think about distance in uh, a, a low dimension doesn't really correspond to distances in uh, large dimensional spaces. So um, it doesn't work very well in dimensions more than um, like 20 or 30. So the idea here is that you want to find the dimensions that are most important to your data set. And in order to do that, um, there's a bunch of different uh, techniques you can apply. Um, we mentioned the one um, that's called TSNE, but there's, there's another one called principal component analysis. And the idea here is if you have some data that's spread out inside of your space, um, you want to find uh, a line or a plane that um, uh, re reduces the, um, the amount of irrelevant data. So you're projecting these points onto this line, and then um, you, you want the line that maintains the greatest separability between all of the points. So if we chose this line, for example, this wouldn't be a very good choice um, because they're all smudged together and it's evenly distributed. Um, but if we chose something like this, then, uh, then the, the, the combination of, of that, uh, those two dimensions in, at that, that angle we would create a new dimension. And then we'd say uh, this, this transformed um, coordinate system is, uh, is what's important. So we reduce, we reduce the amount of dimensions from two to one here. And you're doing this for a lot of different dimensions. So um, once you do that, once you get into a smaller amount of dimensions, then you can apply um, something uh, like, uh, like k-means. And um, this is a, a two-dimensional um, principal component uh, PCA a compression um, of the MNIST data set. So um, with this, this was generated by, uh, by Python as well. But uh, that's another um, advantage of knowing uh, or using Python is that it has a bunch of libraries for doing plotting um, that are a little bit uh, more difficult to get up and running using, using Java. So, um, so a lot of the data preprocessing will happen um, in languages like, like Python or R or uh, Octave. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how we, um, we pre-process the data and transform it. Um, so the, the data engineering sp phase, uh, or cleaning phase, um, consists of a lot of different steps. And this is probably where the most of your work is going to take place if you're um, a data scientist or you're interested in machine learning, is getting the data, sort of teasing out the relationships that are important and the ones that are less important. Um, so first is selecting the data from a population. You have uh, a population of data, uh, and it, it may not be evenly selected throughout um, your the, the, the population that you're interested in. So the data you have may not be the data you need. So maybe you need to go find um, a better representation uh, of the the global population, the demographic. Um, and once you have that, uh, there's, there's statistical tools to analyze um, the quality uh, of your selection um, the, and the, the amount of data you need to, to do that, to do uh, any kind of valid analysis. Um, and this is, this is sort of step one. Then you can kind of process the data into the format that you need. Um, this involves uh, selecting certain features, um, sampling, uh, sort of randomize the, the order. So let's say if um, you're working with time series data um, and there's, you're, you're sampling things at the, um, sequentially, then you, you may want to, to um, sam sample it uh, randomly or something from your entire data set. So um, this is uh, an important process, and there's a lot of um, great resources for how to do this. Um, we don't have uh, some examples to show you, but um, I highly recommend checking out the, the, the links afterwards, and they'll go into some of these 
steps in depth. Um, so finally, uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you've selected all the data you need, it's all cleaned up, um, and it's in, uh, you know, if, it, if it's in buckets, um, this is helpful sometimes. So you have time series data, you want to bucket the data. Um, it comes in as timestamps, you want to um, fit it in to hours or to days or to things that make sense. Um, then this is, this is something that may, may, might make sense to, to, to do. Um, but you have to be careful not to introduce uh, any kind of um, bias into the model but by the way you're, you're structuring your, your features. So this is kind of a very careful dance that data scientists do to avoid influencing the results um, by trying lots of different combinations of, of features. Um, so when you're doing uh, transformation, typically what you want to do is to scale and normalize the data. Um, so usually it, it's, it's normalized between um, either negative one and uh, one or zero and one. Um, and uh, you'll deal with floating point numbers. Uh, so if this is um, a, a numerical category or a variable parameter, then you want to uh, kind of normalize this into a, a small area. And then all of these features you want to normalize as well. So if you have um, one parameter that ranges from um, zero to a million, and another one that ranges from, uh, say, like zero to one, then um, you're, you're doing uh, gradient descent and backpropagation on a very narrow and long uh, set of data. And so uh, it can have effects on how, you, uh, how quickly you learn. And so y y you want things to be kind of normalized, which is the, uh, the goal of transformation. And then you can select um, uh, certain features, aggregate them, and uh, do dimensionality reduction. So when you're evaluating the quality of your, your model, the results, um, you have a bunch of different metrics to do this. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, outside the original data set, you want to break this into a bunch of different categories and then test it on data that it's never seen before. So um, a very common uh, mistake that people make as they're training these models is that um, they overfit it to the training data. And so by randomizing the data and selecting out um, a small percent of that, for the, or a, for a portion of that for the training set, then you avoid this, this problem. Um, and then, uh, you, you, so those, there's, there's a test set where you, where you evaluate the, uh, the, the quality of the model. As we mentioned, the, the, the false positive, the false negatives, and um, true positive and true negatives. And this gives you uh, a sense of the, uh, the accuracy and the recall, um, the precision and the recall of the model. Um, and then, uh, so, so sometimes you have a bunch of different competing models. Um, and so you can, you can further separate this out into a validation set. So maybe if you have uh, more than one, then you want to uh, do something uh, sort of akin to A-B testing. Um, so uh, I, I, I mentioned we'd pause for a moment um, if there are any questions. So, uh, if you have a question, uh, you can raise your hand, uh, speak it. I don't think there's a microphone. I'll repeat it, and then um, we can uh, we, we can try to address those. And then uh, finally, I want to show you um, some of a little bit of the uh, deep learning for J API and how you can use that. So um, we're nearing uh, about let's see an, an hour and a half, and uh, if there's any questions about any of the content we've discussed, uh, I'll be happy to answer that now. Um, yes, in the middle row. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. 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 Uh, so the question was, is it possible to use the results of, of one neural network to inform um, maybe the input uh, of something else that you're training? Or So um, uh, the gentleman asked if, if it's possible to use uh, the results of a, a trained model, um, some knowledge that you've, you've, you've learned, a pattern that you've, you've found in the data, and then um, transfer this to uh, some other domain or to, to, to specialize it, maybe. Um, and this is an area uh, that's, that's well-researched. Uh, it's... It's typically known as, as, as transfer learning. And a lot of the, um, the tutorials about uh, uh, popular machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow and a little bit uh, of deep learning for J will cover this, is uh, taking uh, a trained model and then using that as uh, adding another layer to that. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the inception model for images. Um, this is, this is a, a pre-trained model uh, that has um, a bunch of different classes and, and it recognizes objects um, uh, like maybe a thousand different classes of objects. Um, so the, the, the architecture of this looks something like this. There's a bunch of uh, different layers and, and um, and their convolutions, and, and these are specialized units that um, recognize low-level features like edges and uh, textures and combinations of these, and then um, as, as you get um, further or closer to the output layer, which is over here, then uh, you get um, patterns between um, uh, higher uh, level combinations of, of features. Um, so, the, so you can take, so you can chop off one of these layers. Say you're interested in um, detecting uh, eyes or something like this. Um, then you can, you can evaluate the results at one of these layers for the task you're doing and then take the output of that and then train, train a new model, excuse me, to um, to transfer some of the knowledge that you've learned inside of this great big model to a specific task. So let's say you don't need to recognize uh, all these um, these specialized things like uh, what is um, uh, a, 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 I don't know a red winged thrush, and it has all these really specialized labels um, for, Im for images. Um, but but you do want to find out you know what the difference between um, say, uh, a bridge and uh, a tree is. And so you can apply um, transfer learning to, to do that. And there's a, a bunch of tutorials for using um, transfer learning with, with TensorFlow, I know. Um, So there's, there's one that covers uh, how to use the pre-trained model um, to, to customize this to your own in specific classes. Um, and, and certainly, like, there's, there's a bunch of research that goes into uh, on to doing, this, doing this well. So, um, so for example, when you're, uh, when you're on Facebook, um, and you see all these tags of uh, your friends, and uh, it recognizes their faces. Well, um, for this particular task, it wouldn't probably wouldn't need to train the entire network from scratch. So it would use um, some portion of the facial recognizer, um, and then uh, retrain this periodically uh, as you um, make new friends uh, to their. Uh, higher level features, so maybe their color of their hair and um, the arrangement of their eyes and mouth. And, and so this, this is um, 
uh, something that takes a lot of time. And so the, the idea is you want to uh, make this as, uh, as efficient as possible by reusing um, parts of your model. And so this is, this is definitely an area that um, uh, is well researched and there's a bunch of tutorials for doing that. Um, I think I think that just about covers it. Did that answer your question? Thanks. All right. Um, As we mentioned before, um, a lot of the, the algorithms that are available uh, to use are, uh, you, you'll, you'll have to read through a lot of literature to actually implement it. And um, if you want to experiment with these things, um, with neural nets and deep, neural, deep learning, then uh, you don't want to have to uh, reinvent the wheel. Um, so you can use uh, a framework, um, there's many good ones, um, for visual recognition, uh, a very good framework um, for, for, for detecting objects and images uh, is called CAFE. Uh, CAFE is uh, also implemented um, with a, uh, a Python front end. And um, it's usually the fastest to adopt state-of-the-art uh, techniques from the literature. Uh, so you can um, certainly take a look at that. TensorFlow is another one. Um, and uh, the one I... I like for doing uh, stuff with with, um, uh, with 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 Java specifically. Java has uh, a lot of great features because um, if you don't know the, the structure of the API, then uh, by working with developer tools, then you can kind of figure it out without having to read a lot of documentation, which is nice. And um, specifically for uh, for this. Uh, this framework, uh, Deep Learning for J, then um, it uses a, a nice builder pattern for helping you to configure the network. Um, so we'll take a look at a few of the examples if you're following along um, inside of the MNIST uh, s section here. And we'll show you how um, this is very similar in a lot of ways to, uh, to TensorFlow. So uh, there's a, a few things that are custom to uh, Deep Learning for J, which are um, the use of uh, its own special library. It tries to model after um, NumPy. It's called ND4J, um, and this is uh, n-dimensional arrays and uh, different uh, mathematical operations you can do on them um, for linear algebra and other stuff. Um, and it also has uh, a library that's sort of similar to, to Pandas if you used Python, which is called um, DataVec. Uh, DataVec is, it helps you um, parse the data and put it in a, a common format. Um, another nice thing about Deep Learning for J is that it's working, um, uh, it, it's, it, so there's, there's a lot of people contributing to it, it's open source, um, and it, it's, it, it's working on providing, uh, it's not quite there yet, but it's working on providing uh, an architecture that you can 
feed to any other framework. Um, so you can port these architectures from one to another, which is kind of neat. Um, and uh, it, it runs on Spark. So um, it's not the fastest uh, framework out there if you're doing um, deep learning pipelines in production and you need uh, raw speed. There's a comparison of uh, the, the speed of different, different frameworks. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, it, it's, it's still in development. Uh, but as the only uh, framework with a, 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 a front end for Java, um, then it, it it's sort of your only uh, available choice. There's a few others, I shouldn't say that. So um, I went to a great session at Java One uh, uh, earl earlier this year, and um, there's more uh, APIs that are available, but they're not really production ready. This is kind of the closest one I found. So it tends to be um, accurate with the state of the art, but it's not very fast. Um, so the way you set it up is um, uh, you have you have some some data iterators that go through your uh, your training data and you feed it um, some some inputs um, and then there's a, there's kind of this fluent interface um, or builder pattern here for configuring the neural net. Um, so here we're doing uh, multi-layer perceptron. And we have uh, a, a configuration, a builder. Um, typically, we feed it uh, a seed. And this random number, random numbers have a kind of a, an interesting relationship with neural nets. Um, you think about, uh, well, if, it w if there's some analogy, an analog to uh, inspiration or creativity. Maybe it's, maybe it's in the neural network, um, the, the, the random number generator, which is, um, which is kind of neat. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, with a small change in the initial seed, um, it, it will, it will uh, kind of give you some, some randomness in, uh, in the output. Uh, but if you want to determinately reproduce it, then you use the same seed. Um, Typically, uh, there's an activation function that you can pass in as well. Um, here we're using uh, a rectified linear unit. This is um, one type of activation function. It has nice mathematical properties um, in that it's, it's, it's smooth and differentiable everywhere except zero. And, um, and it works a little better than, uh, than just doing um, a step function or um, something like a sigmoid function, which we were we kind of hinted at earlier. Um, uh, there's there's a, a weight initialization process. And here, um, there's a bunch of different ones you can use. I'm not entirely sure what the difference between them are for, um, for, for certain, certain ones will be used in certain architectures, but I'm not sure why. Um, so sometimes they're, they're normally distributed throughout the space or a uniform value, just zero or something with uh, another distribution. Um, here you specify the learning rate. And typically, this is uh, a small number between um, like 0 0.001 and 0 0.03, uh, depending on. Uh, well, you, you have to kind of experiment a little bit. But if it's too large, like we mentioned, it will skip over. Um, minimums. So you, as, as you're traversing the error surface, um, you want to have a, a small update rate uh, initially. And then as you kind of explore, then you can kind of add momentum. Um, but it's important to, to make this um, small enough so that it doesn't miss updates, but also large enough so that it doesn't take till the end of um, you know, the week to finish. Um, so we use an updater here. Uh, this is a little bit different than TensorFlow, I believe, um, in that uh, you can specify this and the momentum. Um, 
usually there are uh, kind of defaults that are, are set for the particular type of gradient descent you're using. So if you're using um, like Adagrad, um, then you, there's some defaults that are available. But I think here, uh, this, this is kind of a little bit um, lower level. And it provides these all of these for you. I'm sure there's ways to do it. I'm just not sure in TensorFlow. Um, and uh, there's, let's see, so there's a regularization um, process. And this is, um, you can set this to true or false, but um, this is used for certain types of neural nets that, um, uh, that it, uh, it, it's, it's, an, it's a parameter that you set. I don't know much more than that. So here you have um, an input layer, uh, the, the hidden layer, and then your output layer here. And they specify um, the cost function for each of these layers. And there's, um, there's a default here that you're missing. But here you're using, um, for the output layer, some, sometimes there's a different uh, activation function, uh, depending on the, the, the classes you're trying to predict. Um, and you're going to do backpropagation to adjust the weights. Uh, as you're fitting the model, um, you're, you're going to feed it the, the iterator. And so this goes through the loop, and then there's an evaluation process as well. Um, there is also, so we'll run this. Um, and here I'm just using the CPU thread, so I don't have uh, Cuda set up right now. Um, and this will make this a little bit faster if you do, uh, but still not so, so fast. So it takes a little while, but the idea here is that this number on the right, um, Ah, so this this number on the right is um, the the error, and this should go down over time. Um, let's see. So this will take a few minutes to finish um, all of the iterations. But while we're waiting for that, there's um, a, a graphical front end. So it's a little bit like TensorBoard um, you can use with Deep Learning for J that uh, allows you to visualize the process of this with all the, um, the parameters and see how they're progressing. Um, So uh, this is uh, sort of appropriate. I guess there's a lot of people visiting the website, and they think it's um, a bot. So we have to prove. This, this will uh, become much more difficult, I think, as or they'll have to switch to a, a different uh, type of uh, CAPTCHA um, as the, the, the models become more sophisticated. So. Um, it'll become much more difficult to tell what's the difference between uh, an actual user and a, uh, a, a machine. There's, um, there's a lot of interesting startups that are, are, are working on um, scraping content. And uh, the content that they, they get is, um, is usually gated by a CAPTCHA. And they're pretty good at solving them. So here, here we have a, uh, the, the front end, the UI for this. Uh, it provides uh, some, some data. You can, you can write to a log, and it'll read from that. It's basically a little bit like graphite. I think it uses graphite behind the scenes. And uh, 
so o over time, you want um, your 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 loss uh, function or the, the cost, the average error to decrease. And if you see this kind of going all over the place and it's not decreasing, then this is a sign that you're you're you've configured something incorrectly. Uh, and as, as you're as you're doing this, you could you keep an eye on this because if it um, sort of stabilizes and doesn't go down, um, then uh, you, 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 you may want to, to rerun it or something's wrong um, with the gradient to back descent or backpropagation. Also, you, you want to take a look at um, uh, the, the quality of the prediction, so the, the accuracy. Um, there's a bunch of different parameters that it tracks here. Um, So, so this UI you can set up with a few lines, and uh, it, it will it will launch in your browser, um, which is neat. Okay, so it finally finished. Um, so it it gives us the uh, score for all these things, and this is good. Um, the model is is highly accurate. Um, uh, the the precision or the ratio of uh, the the let's see ah okay so this this graphic is pretty helpful if you ever forget um, precision is the the ratio of the true positives to um, the true positives plus the f false positives. And the recall is um, how many, okay, so how many relevant items are selected. Um, so the true positives outside of the f false negatives. Hmm. Okay, so well, it provides you all three of these scores and, um, and you, can, you can evaluate this uh, yourself, but this is a pretty good model. Uh, and let's see, this should be competitive with ah. Uh, so this is this is like a f this is about competitive with um, yeah two two layer neural nets. Uh, from like 1998, state of the art. Um, hmm. So there's some examples here for regression. Uh, typically, for regression uh, in low number of dimensions or um, simple regression, it, using a neural net is is complete overkill. So you don't need to um, use a neural net. You can you can um, analytically solve these for a lot of different types of problems. Um, so it, there's, there's like closed form solutions for, for these, for, um, for data in a small number of, um, in a small number of dimensions. So you can, you can just plug this into equation and usually get the, the output. But for more complex stuff, um, you want it to use uh, an, a neural network for, because you can, you can, train a neural network to approximate an arbitrary function um, if you have enough uh, neurons, which is, which is kind of uh, this, the stepping stone to, um, to doing more complex stuff. Um, so there, there are some really interesting examples here for doing NLP, um, and there's this cool uh, exercise um, that walks you through a uh, word to vec example. Um, so you can model uh, sentences and um, uh, n-grams uh, as, as vectors, which is um, really useful if you want to do um, any kind of uh, transformation between grammars and things like this. There's some, some great resources for learning about um, word to vec and uh, both with TensorFlow and, and this, this library. Um, and also some unsupervised examples. So uh, 
there's another type of unsupervised learning called autoencoders. Um, and these use uh, so, uh, a little bit like uh, a neural net in, in reverse. Um, so uh, you, can, you can check this out. There's, So the data we're, reading, we're reading in here, uh, let me see. We're, we're reading through the MNIST data set. And it looks like they may have scrubbed the uh, labels from the data set. And they're trying to, to figure out the classes without the labels. Um, but this may take us all night, so um, I don't think we'll wait for it to finish. Um, one great resource for trying uh, out these these things for open data sets um, is uh, there's a great collection of awesome public data sets. Um, And uh, this uh, is a collection of data sets from like Kaggle, which is uh, a competition for um, doing machine learning. Uh, some companies will post uh, samples of their data with the uh, in identifying information scrapped, and th you'll try to predict some uh, some interesting thing, some some pattern that they're they're looking for. Um, and uh, that's a great way to to practice. Um, this is another. A uh, great resource for public data sets that you can use. Um, that you can just go download one of these um, and train your model on this. There's links to all of these at the end of the slides. So I'll show you those. Um, at I'll post these slides at the end. Um, okay. So uh, I think we might finish a little early, since that was about the, the, the bulk of the content that I had for you today. We talked a little bit about supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning, and gave you um, a quick taste of some of the frameworks that you can use um, to, to do these uh, these techniques without a whole lot of background in uh, machine learning or statistics or data science. It's kind of just um, a, a quick taste at, at the techniques you can use to, um, to get some interesting results. Um, I just recently I read that there's uh, some, some very um, uh, exciting news. Uh, if, if you're doing re reinforcement learning, then um, there there's a, there might be a competition. So you can, you can train uh, your model on, um, uh, on, on, on a, a game that's well-defined, uh, and you don't have perfect information uh, between all of the agents. So this is kind of the, the pinnacle of reinforcement learning, is that once we can solve this uh, in general with limited information of the entire environment, which is kind of similar to what we do, when we're playing games, um, then uh, then you can do some pretty powerful things. So, for example, if you're doing reinforcement learning, you might be interested in checking out um, the, uh, the 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 StarCraft uh, data set, which was um, made available uh, through uh, Blizzard and um, DeepMind, and they're working on uh, uh, on this problem uh, on beating a human player. Um, so the, the gist of reinforcement learning, as we mentioned, is that you have uh, an agent that's continuously learning from the environment. There's no teacher, per se, um, but it gets a reward signal every time it takes an action, and it, it gets the updated state of the environment. And this may be a partial view or an imperfect view of 
the whole environment, but it's, uh, it's what you have to work on. And the goal here is to maximize your, your total reward. Uh, that's how it's modeled. And um, it's, it, it's a little more resilient. Uh, so if you can do this in real time, if you can learn and update your model and relearn, then, then this is um, much more powerful than just being able to learn from a fixed data set and then um, the underlying assumptions that you made while training your data may have changed. So uh, this, is, this is kind of much more robust against um, changing uh, environments, like maybe if you're trying to predict the price of a stock, then this will, uh, uh, this will have a, a lot of ramifications for, uh, for algorithmic trading um, for a lot of different fields. Um, so there's some tutorials for doing re reinforcement learning in uh, TensorFlow. Unfortunately, I did not see any um, the last time I checked with Deep Learning for J. However, um, I, I believe they're focusing on processing um, business pipelines and, and doing um, numerical data analysis. So maybe this is not their priority uh, at the moment, but it, it's a very exciting um, area of research. And uh, there's some, some some new papers that talk about them um, in the latest uh, ISVLR, the the the, uh, the, the, the international um, uh, conference that happens for machine learning, uh, specifically for deep learning. There's a lot of interesting results. So um, I'll give you a quick peek at the resources um, that I use to uh, to learn some of um, these techniques and ones you can also use. Um, I highly recommend uh, the, the Neural Networks um, course from uh, Coursera from Andrew NG, uh, Andrew Ng. And he, uh, he, he's developed um, a lot of these techniques in commercially and academically and has a very good um, background on doing that. Um, so uh, there's, there's classes that are periodically given and it's a great way. You can just sit in on the class or uh, take the entire thing. Um, brush up on your machine learning if it's been a while since um, your last CS course. Um, uh, the, the, the course notes for doing um, visual object recognition from CS231 are excellent. They're very good. They're um, Andre Karpathy. Uh, he, he gives a course at Stanford uh, that, that talks about uh, uh, convolutional and recurrent null nets and um, doing these for uh, for specifically for image recognition, um, the uh, the post that I mentioned a little earlier um, for visualizing MNIST is uh, pretty cool, and you should check that out. It's all implemented, I believe, in JavaScript. Um, there is a model zoo uh, that you can check out, and um, some and there's an excellent book, by the way, um, by Michael Nielsen, uh, Neural Networks and Deep Learning. If you're interested in uh, learning more about the math behind it. The, the mathematical background provides is, is, is excellent. It's very, um, it's very good. It uses latex and everything. So this is, this is um, if, if, if you're interested in, in some of the, uh, the, the calculus behind the gradient descent, it has a great background on that. Um, and uh, finally, if you're learning, if, if you're interested in TensorFlow specifically, uh, you can check out uh, this workshop, which is very good. That has uh, a lot of the same materials um, and 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 more uh, that are available in, in Deep Learning for J. And um, although it's it's uh, a much newer framework, it has a lot of momentum behind it. So you'll see uh, a lot of the state of the art techniques uh, quickly implemented. Um, in, in, in Java and probably more likely in, in Python, since this is the um, kind of the lingua franca uh, for data scientists. Um, so I'd like to give a special thanks to our hosts, uh, our, uh, the, 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 pr the program committee uh, at the DevOps, and um, uh, for the folks who developed uh, these platforms. It wasn't um, always clear that this was that this, the, uh, that the algorithms that you need to do these would be, um, one, available 
uh, completely open source, uh, and two that are um, uh, you know that, that are non proprietary. proprietary. Uh, and, and that you can do this sustainably. And so um, these guys, if you're working with Java and you'd like to do machine learning, uh, are, are doing great work for uh, porting a lot of these algorithms. Um, you should check out Skymind. Um, they have some um, very good APIs for Java. Um, and I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, my family uh, who um, made this possible. Uh, and... Um, uh, I, if you have any questions, I'll be around all week, so uh, feel free to, to contact me. Thank you very much. I appreciate your coming, and uh, I hope you have uh, a very uh, educational and informative week here at, at DevOx. Um, I, I'm very much looking forward to hearing some of the other speakers. I know there will be excellent talks this week, so uh, looking forward to seeing you there.